Are people afraid of you, Beth? Uh-huh. Who's afraid of you, Beth? John. Your brother. And what is your brother... Why is your brother afraid of you? Because I hurt him so much. Mm-hmm. Okay. And... What... At nighttime, what do your parents do to your door? Lock it shut. Mm, why do they lock it shut? Because they don't want me to hurt John. Right. And they're kind of afraid of... Of hurting John? Of you hurting John? Mm-hmm. Okay. Are they afraid that you might hurt them? Yep. Would you, Beth? Mm-hmm. When would you do it? Right now. Okay. Why would you do nighttime? Because I don't like them seeing me do it. But they can tell me do it. Mm-hmm. And what would you do to them, Beth? Stab them. What would you stab him with? A knife. The program you are about to see was compiled from the actual therapy tapes of Dr. Ken McGid, a clinical psychologist specializing in the treatment of severely abused children, children so traumatized in the first years of life that they do not bond with other people. They are children who cannot love or accept love, children without conscience who can hurt or even kill without remorse. This film shows the devastating effects of abuse on a child. It also shows that victims can be helped. It is the story of a six and a half year old girl named Beth. Do you ever stick pins in people? Mm -hmm. Who? My brother. Okay, do you do it a little bit or a lot? A lot. Okay. And what are you trying to do to your brother? Kill him. Why do you want your brother to die? Because I was hurt so bad and I don't want to be around people. Okay. Who else would you like to stick pins into? Mommy and Daddy. What would you like to have happen to them? Die. Jesus could have lived to save Israel, yet he chose to die to save the world. Tim is the minister of a small Methodist church in the South. He and his wife, Julie, have been married for 12 years. Unable to have children of their own, they decided to adopt. In February of 1984, they received a call from the Department of Social Services telling them they had two children available for adoption. They were told that Beth, 19 months old, and her brother Jonathan, seven months old, were normal and healthy. We did not need children to make our lives complete. We felt secure in ourselves and secure in our relationship, but we wanted to share that with somebody else, and we felt like we had a lot to pass on to a child, and that was what we really wanted to do. And when the phone call came, it was like, at last it's here. It seemed like a miracle. It had happened so quick. We'd heard of couples having to wait five, ten years on, on a child, and here we had two young children. Um, it was like the answer to our dream. Their dream became a nightmare when they realized that Beth and Jonathan had severe emotional problems. We had the kids with us, uh, Beth and her younger brother John, for uh, probably a couple of months until we began to learn something about their background and their past. And when we learned it, uh, some things seemed to fall in place about her behavior and John's behavior. Uh, from several sources, we discovered that uh, that they didn't have enough food to eat. Um, that perhaps even <clears throat> Beth went all day maybe with just a box of kick cereal. John himself was found in a, a bassinet with uh, little patches of urine all over it and a dirty diaper and couple of bottles at his feet that had curdled milk and the back of his head was completely flat uh, the front of his head had bulged out and he, at uh, seven months he couldn't raise his head couldn't roll over um, he was uh, just had had no stimulation 
And uh, we think perhaps that it happened to Beth, and it wasn't very long until uh, she began showing some signs of perhaps uh, even some abuse. Um, there was a nightmare uh, that she had, and the nightmare was about um, a man who was falling on her and uh, hurting her with a part of himself. Tell me about your birth father. What was that nightmare like? When he touched my vagina. Okay. Until it bled. Hurt it a lot until it bled. And, um, wouldn't feed me a lot. He'd hit on me. Wouldn't be very nice to me. How old were you? One. And in your nightmare, what happens? I get real scared. Where are you in the nightmare? What happens in the dream? I'm in the house, upstairs. And then what happens then? When he comes upstairs and, um, hurts. How do you feel when you talk about this? Scared. Where's your birth? Where's your birth father? What's he doing? He's right there, and there's his hand. His hand's right there. Where? Right there. You can't hardly see it because it's green. What's it touching? My vagina. And what is your birth father doing? Heart nut. Your face looks uh, sad. Can you tell me about that? Mm-hmm. It's crying because that's Thoughts of the tears. Beth had endured severe neglect and abuse as a child. Her birth mother died when she was one. Because of these early childhood experiences, Beth never developed a sense of conscience, love, or trust for anyone. The early sexual abuse by her birth father would cause her to exhibit inappropriate sexual behavior, especially toward her brother. Does your brother have private parts? Um. Yeah. Yeah. What are the, what is his private parts? Penis and butt. Mhm. Mm and what do you do with your brother with his private parts, Ben? I hurt it. Tell me about it. What do you do? Well, I pinch it. Um. Squeeze it. Mm. Kick it. When you do things to your brother's private parts, what does he say? Stop. Okay, tell me that. Well, he says stop, but I don't stop. Do you hurt him? Mm-hmm. A lot. Okay. And would you like to do that to other boys? <laughs> When I, I caught her with Jonathan one morning, she was molesting him. Um, he was crying and his pants were down, and I said, Beth, what's happening? And she said, I pulled his penis and put my finger up his anus. And uh, I said, didn't he say to stop? And she said, yeah, he did. And I said, did you? And she said, no. Have you ever rubbed your private parts? Mm-hmm. Do you do it a lot? A lot. How much do you do that? About every single day and that's into... I did it every single day until it got real bad and I stopped and I had to go to the doctor and I did not like it. What, what do you mean by real bad? Well, it looked real raw, got all kinds of boo-boos on it, germs. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff from my hand. And it bled? Mm-hmm. She started to masturbate at inappropriate times. Um, I remember one time, typically, when we were at the hospital waiting for Tim to come out, he was there visiting, and Beth and John were in the back seat, and I turned around, and, and she had her legs spread and was masturbating in a public parking lot. And I had tried to explain to her nu numerous times before that, that that's private area. You don't do it in public places. And um, gone over that with her and, 
and it never seemed to face her. And um, Julie, how often would your daughter masturbate? Daily, constantly. Do you have animals, Beth? Four of them. Can you tell me their names? Cloudy, Shuggy, Darcy, and Annie. And Daddy said um, a day ago that um, there was a stray cat who did not have a home, so Daddy is was taking care of it and took it to the vet when he started when he had a flight to go. And what do you do to the animals, Beth? Stick them with pins. Do you stick them a little bit or a lot? A lot. What are you trying to do to the animals, Beth? Kill them. What do they do when you stick them with the pins? Well, Annie cries. She's a dog. She got baby birds down out of the nest, and we thought maybe she was just curious. So we explained that she could hurt them, um, put them back, and went through a whole sitting down and talking to her about the problem of it. And the next day we went out to check the baby birds and they were on the ground dead with her, their necks broken. Let's talk about what happened once when you were smaller, when you, when you found some baby birds in a, in a tree. What, what did you do then? I took them out. Mm -hmm. And what did Mom say to you? Um, that the mother will not come back if somebody touches her baby. Mm -hmm. Are the baby birds kind of small? Can you describe them for me? Well, they don't have their eyes open, but they can hear, hear me and they look up. Are they kind of helpless, little baby birds? Can they fly? No. Can they run away? Uh, yes. They can? Are they easy to catch or hard to catch? Hard? Yeah. Well, it's hard to remember. With the baby birds, what did you do? I took them out of the tree. And what did you do with them? Played around too rough. Also, when at the end, I picked it up and I thought it was dead, and I came to say, Mommy, is this bird dead? And she said, um, she called Daddy and said, Tim, and, um, and Daddy came and, um, I think I remember that they said yes. Mm-hmm. And so, so did the little baby birds die? I don't know. You don't remember? I just remember that I think I remember that Mommy and Daddy said the last bird we got was dead. Do you know what Mom said to me? She said that all of them were dead. Did you squeeze them? Did Baby Beth squeeze them? You're doing a good job, honey. Go ahead and tell me what happened. I squeezed them. And what happened? They died. But this kind of aggression at our animals, and even uh, at our brother Jonathan, was beginning to, uh, to grow to such an excess that our life was miserable at home. We had, John would cry uh, in the mornings and say his stomach hurt. We, for the longest time, we thought maybe this child has, uh, uh, has some problem with his intestinal area or maybe he has allergies. And so we tried to get all that checked out. Come to find out, Beth was coming out of her room and hitting him in the stomach. And so as a last resort, just to protect him, we had to tie her door shut. So I guess for what the last three or four months now, we've had to tie her in at night, sort of barricade her. The repercussions of Beth's tragic childhood led to uncontrollable rage. Despite the love and nurturing of her adoptive parents, she took this rage out on herself, on her brother, and on them. 
her acts of violence became more and more cruel and frightening. Well, I noticed several, uh, like paring knives in the kitchen, missing. And my first thought was Beth. And I felt a little guilty about it at first. I thought, no. Nah. But um, I, I really didn't even mention it to her. They had been gone several weeks. She was sitting at the table drawing and mentioned to me, what do those knives look like that are gone, Mom? And I said, what knives, Beth? And um, she said, weren't they kind of silver and about this big? And um, I knew then, and then this little smile that's not, not a sweet smile, but a malicious type of smile. And I knew then, I thought, she's got them. Tell me about the knives. Where did you get them? From the drawer. And where else? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Tell me about it. I got them from the dishwasher. What kind of knives? Um... Big sharp ones. And what do you want to do with those knives? Tell John and Mommy with them and Daddy. And when Mommy asks you about where the knives are, what do you say? I don't know where they are. What did you think she might do with the knives? My first thought was Jonathan. And the reason we thought that was that she had, by this time, she had tried to kill John on several occasions and, and openly admitted that. In the basement, she was hitting his head against a cement floor. I heard his screams and ran down and had to literally pull her hands off, and she looked wild-eyed. Did you get real mad at him? Did, did you hit his head real hard? Tell me about it. What did, how many times did you do it? A lot? Hmm. What was the floor like? Clean up. And what happened to your brother? Tell me about it. His head hurt real bad. But his chin, he had to have stitches in it. Could you stop? Use your words, Beth. No. Okay. What was your brother doing when you were doing this? Playing with the, with the toys. Okay. Was he asking you to stop when you when you were doing it? Mm -hmm. What was he saying? He was saying, Beth, stop. And what did you do? I didn't stop. I just kept on hurting him. What were you thinking when you were doing that? Thinking of killing him. How did you stop? Mm. What made you stop? When I heard Peter walking across the kitchen. Mm -hmm. That made me stop because I thought Mommy and Daddy were coming. Okay. Did Mommy come? What did she do? She sent me to my room. Okay. Um, and what if mom didn't stop you? What would you have done? Kept on doing it. And what about, what about... After evaluating the extent of Beth's psychological problems, Dr. McGid felt that for the well-being of the family, Beth needed to be temporarily separated from them. In April of 1989, her parents brought her to a special home with an expert at raising children with early attachment disorders, especially children who are dangerous to themselves and others. I have children that have killed numerous times. Cold-blooded family members, neighbor children, killed them. And they can do it. Makes my blood run cold just thinking about nine years old. People don't think a nine-year-old is capable of cold-blooded murder, but they are. That attachment break does severe damage to the heart, the ability to care and the ability to love. If they don't care and they don't love, 
They're capable of anything. We're very strict very strict about everything. Everything is completely monitored. We take complete control because a child who's unattached does not trust. And because they don't trust, they don't allow anybody to be boss of them. So we take complete control. They are not boss of anything. They have to ask to get a drink of water. They have to ask to go to the bathroom. They have to ask to leave our site. Part of that is because we cannot trust them because of the damage that they've done before. Uh, Beth, would you like to say grace, please? Sure. Jeremy, Father, thank you for this good day and everybody doing good. Just name it. Amen. Amen. They believe that they're evil, they believe they're from the devil, they believe that they are not a person of value and we have to change that and we have to build that from a child who's nothing, who's, who's a bad kid in their own mind, to a child who's valuable and loving and they see themselves as that. You don't have to bite this. When they do a chore well, we can say, you did a good job, you're a good worker. And then it just builds that self-esteem little by little so that they change the way that they see themselves. Several months into treatment in this controlled environment, Beth had made progress, and her therapist decided to loosen some of the controls. Anybody want some more? I can Beth continued to show signs of improvement. She began to develop a sense of right and wrong. She seemed to respond to affection, was more outgoing. She went to public school, made friends at the local church, and even sang in the choir. And you're going to go into Sunday school again this morning? Yeah. And get stickers? Maybe you could put one on your nose. the years you made it clear that the time of Christ was near. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a beard. See his beard. There's his nose, and that's his. Oh, I see. Yeah, see his beard is kind of flowing in the wind and everything. Elijah taking up into heaven the fiery chariot, huh? Well, that's that's where that's Elisha. That's the the other prophet that took Elijah's place, and he was left. And, and there's Elijah, you know. And he learned about sheep. And the Lord is my shepherd. Mm -hmm. March 3rd, you just got that yesterday, huh? Mm -hmm. In the beginning, we couldn't trust her with anything. She was locked up at night. We had alarms on the door at night, so she wasn't sneaking around doing things with the other children. We don't worry about that anymore. There's no alarm on her door at night now. She sleeps in the same room with my own daughter, and I trust her that much. She brushes the dogs, and I trust her that much. Because she has earned that trust, she's learned it, she's, she has a heart, and she has a love inside, and she feels bad when she does something now. In the past, because she didn't have a conscience, she didn't feel anything when she did something bad. There was just no feeling there. And now she does feel bad, and it shows in her face. I believe that Beth can make it. She's got a really bright mind. She's got a good heart now, which has done a lot of healing. She's got a really super set of parents. They're powerful, they're knowledgeable, they're motivated. Um, she's done a lot of good work with you in therapy, with Canal and with myself. She wants to heal, and that's the number one key. And she wants to heal because she has a family that really cares about her, and she wants to be with them. Do you know where that anger came from? That's when my brother um, hurt me. I, I had it all inside and I remembered it and I started doing it. And what did, what did that do when it was inside? It made me want to hurt people really bad. And who did you hurt? My brother, my mom and dad, and animals. And animals. Who did it hurt the most? My brother. Who did it hurt the most? Me. Why don't you tell me that? Who it hurt. 
It hurt me the most. How did it hurt you the most? Because when I hurt other people, um, I'm burning my um, dead self. How do you feel right now, Beth? It's kind of tough to talk about, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Beth gave her last interview for this film in December of 1989. Although she had made progress, she would still need extensive therapy. Not all abused children are as deeply scarred as Beth, but all abused children suffer a profound hurt for the rest of their lives. The road to recovery is long and hard for the abused child. There are more than one million new victims of child abuse in America every year.